You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, episode number 170. It's kind of fun to do the impossible. Walt Disney. Broadcasting from a dark, windowless room in Hollywood, when we really should be working on that next draft. It's the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, showing you the craft and business of screenwriting while teaching you how to make your screenplay bulletproof. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Now, today's show is sponsored by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie's going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. Today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle Pro, our private and growing community for filmmakers and screenwriters. It was created for film creatives like you to meet, network, and support each other, learn from film industry experts, and to get the answers to your burning questions and more. The journey in this business is rough. There is no guarantee to success, but your chances of reaching your goals dramatically improve when you find others who are on the same journey as you and you work together towards a common goal. That is why I put together IFH Pro. Inside, you'll get professional networking, private and safe spaces to discuss the film business, access to advanced tools and education, up-to-date education, exclusive content not available publicly, access to IFH Pro workshops, webinars, special guests, and so, so much more. If you want to check it out, head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash pro. Well, guys, today on the show, we have filmmaker and best-selling author Mick Herbis Cherrier. Now, Mick is not only an award-winning screenwriter working on multiple projects currently, but he is also an instructor, a teacher, and the best-selling author of the textbook, Voice and Vision, A Creative Approach to Narrative Film Production. Now, in this conversation, Mick and I go deep into what it's like to be a screenwriter, what truly is the bus- what the business is all about, his, his kind of horror stories, what mistakes he sees young screenwriters make, his ups and downs, and so much more. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Mick Herbis Cherrier. I'd like to welcome to the show Mick Herbis Cherrier. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and you did perfectly. I uh, thank you. <laughs> I mean, it was we were we were. We, I wanted to make sure I got that name proper and didn't massacre. Yeah. So I'm glad I did. How are you doing, no, my friend? I'm good. I'm very happy to be on your show. Um, you know, I've seen a number of your podcasts, and I think that we have a kind of a similar mission. You know, we we love films. Mm-hmm. We love good films. We want to make sure that good films continue to be made. <laughs> and so we're informing people how what is a good film? What makes a good film? Um, yeah. How do you Absolutely. make them? Yeah, exactly. And it is a mystery because they're they're becoming less and less nowadays. Uh, bully. It's just it's not as easy to you know when i was growing up in the 80s and the 90s i mean there were ma- there were so many masters at work uh during that yeah. time period and there and many of them are still at work uh yeah. and then every time i hear, i'm like oh that was a great movie i'm like who made it i'm like oh someone from the 80s and 90s yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but not to say that they're not amazing artists doing work today i mean look at chris nolan uh-huh. i mean look at fincher i mean these kind of guys who who came up well the fincher came up in the 90s but but Nolan and those kind of guys, they're newer generation. There's so many great, great oh, yeah. filmmakers and screenwriters nowadays. But oh, yeah. it's Absolutely. it's harder to find. But it's harder to get them made. And I think that's the, the biggest problem is there's a lot of great scripts out there, but there's not a lot of great scripts that are being given the opportunities that they were given in the 80s, 90s, and even in the early 2000s. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I think it's much harder. <clears throat> Obviously, it's harder to, to sell a spec script. 
you know, uh, these days. Um, uh, even even if you have some sort of property that's an interesting property, um, what I've noticed recently uh, is that so much depends on the team you put together, uh, because that makes a producer, that makes a production company feel more uh, comfortable and more safe. That this is a team that has a track record. They know how to put this thing together. They recognize good stuff. I like the stuff that they've done, and then and they don't necessarily feel like they're taking a big chance. Um, because, you know, everybody's job all the way up the ladder is on the line. And it's just uh, always to say no. It's a, it, Their job is to say no. It, as yeah. much as they might want to say yes, they, their job is to say no because they're, it's the whole town is run by fear. Yes. The entire town. Although, interestingly, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I uh, fairly re- – just before COVID hit, I w- went on a, you know, a pitch session to a number of different uh, production companies. Their job is to say no. They don't like to say no. They don't. They don't. Uh, because they don't want to be the person who said no to the thing that got made. So they're very always very positive. And oh, then you oh. kind of lose them, you know? It is mean, the- I'm telling you, Alex, I was at a pitch session and it went well. The, we pitched. There were three of us pitching. It went spectacularly. It was for a television program. Mm-hmm. And the producer jumped out of his chair and said, okay. What we need for you guys, what we need to do is get money for you guys to write the pilot and uh, get a Bible together. And I was like, my God, is it true? The first person we went to, we sold the show in the room. Um, And so I walked out and I talked to the person I was writing with, who's much more experienced than I am in some of these things. I said, "That, that was an amazing response that he just said yes right away. He said, oh, no, no, that's not a yes. That we don't know what that is. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I've never L.A. and Hollywood in general. It's an art form of how they say piss off. I mean, mm. it's really it is a, it's a, it really is artful in the way that they give back negative critiques. But they do it in yeah. such a way that you don't even know that you're just being told to just screw off. It, yeah. It's <laughs> it's what because they don't want to be the person. So this is the two fears. I don't want to be fearful enough to green light this and then it bombs, I lose my job. I don't want to also pass on the next big thing when they yeah. when they find out about it and I lose my job. So it's exactly. all about losing my job. So what's the bigger fear? And generally speaking, the bigger fear is to produce something that bombs because that's more right. concrete. Yes. So that's why they, sure. they they say no, but they don't want to say no. They want they want your project to be the next yeah. big thing they wanted to be make a billion dollars and, and and to launch a franchise and and yeah. all that kind of stuff but that's just the way the world <laughs> works but yeah you know it's kind of a vice it's kind of a squeeze for them because you know they need new content they need new makers they need fresh ideas they need people who um are good writers they need these things it's the lifeblood of the industry but they they are you know, afraid of making some wrong choices. So um, that's sort of the thing that keeps people going is that, you know, it they need, they need um, talent. But I, I would, I would argue that everything you just said really focuses mostly on television now, <laughs> as yes. opposed to features. Features, if you notice, are not new ideas. They're all based on existing IP, especially at the studio level. Indies are different, but indies are, are, are are going the way of the dodo. They really are in, in many ways. They're, it's not as robust of a business as it was in the 90s because in the 90s, you know, I, you know, I was speaking to some filmmakers from that era and they said the reason why my film got picked up was because there was a business starting to come around, VHS, home videos, you know, then DVDs. There was an actual industry, a, a business way to make money with Films like Slackers and Clerks and El Mariachi. And there was a business that 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 infrastructure doesn't exist now because there's so much competition now for it that yeah. it's for features I'm talking about. But for television, yes. it's all about original ideas. It's it, yes. completely about original ideas. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because there's no there's no way you're going to get get it. Um... If you're not a known writer, there's no way you're going to get a co- commission for a feature film. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. But and and. And, you know, there's no way you're going to get money uh, for a pitch or a treatment or something like that to develop it. Um, In television, that still happens um, because it's the Wild West. Like which of these, you know, billion 
platforms, streaming platforms are going to survive. And in order to survive, they need new content. They need original content. And so they're out there looking for that stuff. And, you know, I also think, Alex, you know, a young filmmaker these days or a young writer, somebody who wants to be a writer or a filmmaker does have to think globally uh, in, mm-hmm. in terms of cinema, you know, because there's still those pathways for interesting feature films happening in international co-productions. Um, and sometimes that's the uh, avenue to open some doors in Los Angeles, even if you if you want to go there. You know, I have a very good friend, um, <clears throat> Sami Zawabi, who uh, is a, a Palestinian Israeli, um, fantastic filmmaker, <clears throat> uh, wrote a screenplay in English, <laughs> though it's supposed to be in Hebrew and uh, and um, um, Arabic. Mm-hmm. Um, tried to get it done here. Nobody would pick it up. And then he went to France and uh, French producers were interested. They got together with, let me see, it was like France, Israel and Luxembourg. And that was the co-production. That film did extremely well. It's a wonderful film. It's called Tel Aviv on Fire. Uh, fantastic film. And now, you know, he when he goes to Los Angeles, people know him. He's created his own, and I'm not going to say brand, but he's sort of developed a profile that people uh, now can recognize and feel comfortable with. So, and he's on his way. Yeah, and and that's another thing. A lot of people think the only place you can make it is Hollywood, but you're absolutely you're. It's they would be wrong because it is. There's such more of a global marketplace than it was in the '90s, in the '80s, in the '90s, uh, even in the early 2000s. It wasn't as a global place because the internet hadn't really taken hold yet. That's and right. It really, and I know people listening like a bunch of old farts talking here, but um, <laughs> you know. But I remember logging into. Netflix and looking at what they had to stream, I'm like, oh, this is all garbage. Like it's just <laughs> complete before they had anything. It was like, oh, it was complete garbage. Uh, you know, know. I remember going down Google and thinking, you can't trust any of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is all this is all horrible. This, information. <laughs> this is horrible. Yeah. So, um, but but because of the the infrastructure that has been built over the years now with the streaming services, the world. It's look look at Squid Games. I mean, yeah. look at a show like Squid Games that showed up like. I haven't seen a, a Korean based television show ever in my life. Yeah, yeah. And when I heard, and I only watched it purely because I kept hearing everybody talk. I'm like, did you see Squid Games? Have you seen Squid Games? I'm like, what is this? I got to watch it. And it yeah. became one of the biggest shows in Netflix history from Korea, not from America, but from Korea in well, Korean. <laughs> This is just after what I'm, I can't remember the title off offhand. Uh, the the Spanish heist film. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, there was that. Yeah, that yeah. Yeah. Again, you know, out of nowhere, not particularly popular in Spain. Right. Uh, but but a huge hit for Netflix. You know. <laughs> Another huge. So there's a lot of those those kind of things. So international, and there's also opportunities internationally that they're just not here in the yeah. U.S. because there's just everybody's here. Yeah. You know, but if you go to France and have a France Israel Luxembourg <laughs> co-production, the amount of competition you have in Europe is a lot less than you have here to make films, especially of a certain kind of genre and so on. But um, I was going to ask you, how did you get started in this insane business? <laughs> wow. Uh, get started in like, I sometimes I feel like I have three full-time jobs. You know, I love writing screenplays. I write screenplays. I, I, I don't relish, um, <clears throat> you know, sacrificing a lot of things for years in order to break in, you know, uh, I also, uh, you know, since the time I was a, um, a kid, you know, I wanted to be a college professor. That was a goal of mine. Even before films, that was a dream of mine. My father was a college professor. Um, my mother was a teacher. My sister's a teacher. My brother's a teacher, you know, so it's in the family. So I always wanted to be a, a professor. Um, and uh, cinema, uh, and of course, my third job are the, the, the textbooks, which I sort of stumbled in more recently, but um, I really love writing these books. It's really a lot of fun. Um, but um, cinema kind of came into my life very early on. I was a, I'm an American citizen, but I grew up overseas. I was born in Izmir, Turkey, you know, I've been in uh, Colombia, I've been in Puerto Rico, Really, where I grew up was Singapore. Mm-hmm. And um, so two things. And so this is like from the age of eight to 13. And this was most of the 70s that I'm, I, I'm living in Singapore. And so um, 
uh, the Shaw brothers were all over the screens in Singapore. And mm-hmm. I, my brother and I would just go to Shaw brothers productions every, you know, a uh, kung fu movie that came out, we were there, and we had we could not speak Chinese at all. Did not matter, yeah. you know. So I, I mean, you know, all those films, with, you know, with those great titles like Blind Swordsman, The Blind Adventure, The Sentimental Swordsman, The One Armed Swordsman, you know, Five Deadly Venoms, Five Fingers of Death, whatever. <laughs> Amazing <laughs> titles. Them all. Yeah, and of course, and of course, any um, any Bruce Lee. Sure, of course, of course. So that that was like one side. And then on the other side, being an American and having never lived in America, have never, never been to the United States, I was obsessed with like um, uh, absorbing any American culture I could. And so when films came, when U.S. films came, even though they were heavily uh, censored, uh, I would have to see them, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, Soylent Green. You know, it was a, it was a big film in, in, in the uh, Patton was a big film. Any James Bond film, um, The French Connection, uh, right. The Exorcist. Oh, Jesus. Even though it was like like it was practically cut in half, you know, by censors. It was a short but film. Was, it was a short film by a guy who got to you. <laughs> but they and they still had the uh, the ambulance, you know, in the uh, in, in the parking lot, you know, uh, promotional <laughs> thing going on. That's amazing. Uh, and then uh, The Sting was one of my one of the oh. great films. I must have seen that like, you know, 15 times. I love that film. Uh, and then. At one point, I saw a film called MASH, Robert Altman's MASH. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I wanted to see it is because I knew that there was American football scenes in it. And I was just obsessed with American football. Mm -hmm. So I went and I remember, boy, I must have been 11. And I remember thinking, this film is making me feel funny. I don't know what it is. I don't quite understand what's going on, <laughs> but it's right. not like the sting at all. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Um, and uh, I think I think that sort of started my whole love affair with films and films that does kind of push the envelope was right there. All right. Now, you've actually been teaching for many, many years. Um, yeah. What is the biggest mistake you see screenwriters make or at least yeah, young screenwriters make? Young screenwriters? <sighs> Well, you know, struggling with the language and struggling with formatting and stuff like that, I don't consider that mistakes. That's just mm-hmm. the way uh, it goes. And, you know, young young uh, writers, uh, I, you know, I teach at Hunter College, and so not all of my students are young, young. When, so when I say young writer, I mean an emerging writer. A yeah, exactly. Writer. A starting writer. Um, I think one thing is that is uh, uh, the lack of patience to develop their craft. <laughs> you know, they watch movies. They feel movies deeply. And they know how to write. Therefore, they feel ready to write a magnum opus immediately. And, you know, you wouldn't feel that way listening to music, thinking, thinking, I'm going to sit at the piano and write a great song, though I don't know how to play the piano. Right. But with film, because we know language and we use words uh, and we can write, somehow they feel like what comes out right away has to be great and i tell them to you know and and it's because they're fueled by passion and so i tell them relax a little bit write a lot uh write you know your 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 first few scripts are not going to be that great i guarantee you um but you will learn from those scripts and you will get better and better it's like it's like anything it's like Playing a guitar, it's like, it's 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 like um, it's like Stephen Curry shooting three pointers. It looks absolutely easy and effortless. When I watch Stephen Curry shoot three pointers, I think I can do that. That's easy. <laughs> it looks so easy. <laughs> it looks so easy, but the amount of drilling and training and practicing that he's put into those shots in his life. Um, makes them look so easy. So, you know, I, I so that's the thing. I, I, I give them the opportunity to I allow them to be patient with their own progress. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I feel too that a lot of, and this was definitely my, it was definitely me when I was starting out is there is that little thing called ego, uh, that also creeps you, it creeps in and everyone's like, wait, I've just written my opus. Why hasn't Hollywood seen my genius and the trucks of money are just dumped in my front yard? Like, I don't understand. And that ego, like we, many, many filmmakers and screenwriters walk into the business, uh, for the wrong reasons, meaning I want to be rich and famous. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Or I want my ego stroked. I want to be on the red carpet and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And uh, I always tell people, because <laughs> I've been around the block a little bit, and I got some shrapnel. I just go, <laughs> they're like, what are we going to do about Bobby? I'm like, don't you worry. The business is going to take care of Bobby. <laughs> it's not a problem at all. Bobby's going to be just fine. It, the other hammer is going to come down any minute now. And if it doesn't come down any minute, it's going to come down in five years when he's still hustling going, wait a minute. Maybe what I'm doing is not working. And I always try to warn people about that, that pitfall because I was, I mean, when you're young, you do things like that. You just like, yeah. obviously it's like you, you know, you watch Reservoir Dogs and you're like, I can do that. And then yeah. you sit down and go, uh, wait, what, why, why is my dialogue not as snappy? <laughs> or even worse, you start doing that again and it's already been done. You know, and, but but you you're not even doing it again. Well, you're doing it again. Yeah, it's exactly. it's a, it's derivative. So in other words, and and by the way, how many? I mean, for for us at a certain age, you know, when Pulp Fiction came out, yeah, how many Pulp Fiction ripoffs yeah. came out within the like the next three or four years? It was just constant pulp, and you could see the writers of those movies trying to emulate the tone and energy of sure. Quentin. And that's not possible. It's because there's only one Quentin. There's only one Sorkin. There's only one Shane Black. There's only one Chris Nolan. These these people are so specific with the way they write that you can't emulate them. And you shouldn't because it's like me trying to emulate Hemingway. Like, right. <laughs> and also, you know, uh, 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 Sorkin wouldn't make a Scorsese film, though he might uh, adore Scorsese. He Correct. He's better than to try and make a Scorsese film because only Scorsese makes a Scorsese film. Yep. Um, yeah, you know, I've been teaching long enough that I see it in waves. You know, I remember when everybody wanted to be David Lynch, and then I remembered when everybody wanted to be, uh, oh, his first name is escaping me, Kaufman. Um, oh, Charlie Kaufman. Charlie Kaufman. That was another wave. Oh, God, can you try to write like Charlie Kaufman? Can you write like Charlie Kaufman? Are you kidding me? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> That was the era when I couldn't sell three-act structure to save my life, you know? Right, exactly. Tarantino and Kaufman just screwed everything up. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, and I think, you know, there, there, there have been others, of course. But, uh, but you know, I actually think that that's going away uh, significantly these days. Because, and it's a very interesting challenge for, for teachers and, and uh, uh, because there isn't any more that I can see a common like lexicon, a common grouping of films that most of the students in the class have watched. I'm seeing right. students breaking apart into much smaller niches. Some of them love the, um, the long form uh, limited series television. Some of them are into Asian film. Some of them are into animated films, really in a big way. Some of them are into the narratives that go into um, video games. Um, and they inhabit those niches with great passion. So you mentioned, you know, I, you know, you mentioned Chinatown. Nobody's seen Chinatown. No. You know, uh, right. you know, you mentioned there's a few films that have stuck around that that you can still. Yeah, Godfather. Yeah, Godfather. Godfather. Maybe. The Fight Club. Yeah. Um, interestingly, The Graduate. And I, and I. Yeah, once, that's interesting. Once asked my class, like, why do you all know The Graduate if you don't know? You know, Chinatown. Chinatown. Uh, and they say, oh, because it's it's plays all the time on television. So they eventually they catch it. So anyway, 
so you're, you're, you're absolutely right because, you know, I mean, coming up, there are there's a group of films, you know, there's like 100 or 200 films that everyone's seen. And, and it's yeah. it's it's very comfortably. Everybody understands, you know, you've seen Goodfellas, you've seen most of Scorsese's work. You know, you yeah. might have not seen After Hours, but you definitely saw Goodfellas. You might have not seen Last yeah. Temptation of Christ, but you probably yeah. saw Casino. You know, yeah. like there's there's a handful of movies of, 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 from directors and of writers that people. But in today's world, you know, when we were coming up, there were less films to watch. You know, yeah. we would get maybe 20 movies a year. That's 20, right. 25 That's movies right. a year. Now we get 20 movies an hour. Uh, exactly. <laughs> released. And everybody knew, like, what the what the Oscar nominees were. Oh. Everybody had seen them and the winners. And, uh, and so I could go into a class and say, all right. Here's an example. And everybody would understand that example. These days I say, here's an example. And, and I see like blank faces. That's the challenging part of teaching. The good part is you can, you can, you, you know, you can show them, um, uh, you know, a film like Ed Wood and blow their minds. You know what I mean? Because nobody's seen it before and they think, oh my God, how do you know about this stuff? You know, you can, you can show them Raging Bull. You know, and they're like, oh, my God, I never imagined. I, I had this experience the other day. I, I, I was talking to these three students who are working together and their film has some resonance with Wings of Desire. And I said, of yeah. course, you guys have seen Wings of Desire. Never saw it. Never heard of Invender. Did they see City of Angels at least? No, I no. <laughs> so, you know, they they watched it and they called back and they said, Professor, you just changed our lives. I thought, well, that was easy. <laughs> it's, so, anyway. it's, yeah, because you're right. You're right. And I've, I've even seen that when I talk to, to filmmakers sometimes, like, you know, that movie that this, like I was, I was, when I was color grading back in the day, I was working with one of the biggest music video directors, uh, in the, in the, in the world at the time. And I'm color grading one of his music videos. I'm like, oh, so do you want me to do this? Like very like Blade Runner esque. And he's like, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, you're a music video director. You've never seen Blade Runner. Are you kidding me? I felt like slapping don't, the guy. <laughs> don't you know you wouldn't even exist as a video music video director without Blade Runner? Without let Ridley? Alone, you know, without Ridley alone, in general? Um, you know, let alone all that jazz, you know, Bob Fosse's all that jazz. But exactly. Anyway. I think I only got to one of the main mistakes. I think you asked me for three. No, no, uh, it's just no, just one of the biggest mistakes. But uh, you know, yeah. there's. Can you discuss a little bit about how? I think one of the biggest things I see when 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 I read screenplays from from younger or newer writers is their use of description, yeah. and uh, they don't. The concept of a, of a sea of white is uh, seeing as much white as possible and what that experience is as far as screen. Because honestly, it was, I think it was Shane Black. I think when Shane Black showed up, he made the screenwriting, reading a screenplay experience like reading a book, like reading a novel. His descriptions yeah. were so tight, so small, yeah. but so descriptive. It was an enjoyable read. And that's when I yeah. think we began to think about, as, as this industry, like, the script needs to be enjoyable to read and also yeah. not have blocks of description that are <laughs> for like, it's, That's it's, right. it's not a novel. So can you talk yeah. a little bit about that? Well, you know, uh, a screenplay is a, is a very complicated man type of manuscript, uh, dramatic manuscript, because it has a technical function, uh, as right. a blueprint for production. Correct. Uh, it also, uh, has to present to the reader as a movie going experience but it also has to be a good read in terms of its language and it has to contain some of the attitude of the movie the tone of the movie uh, the genre of the movie in its language and this is kind of the more advanced um uh, uh sort of um level of of screenwriting and we're seeing um people uh, more and more understanding that you can push rules of screenwriting. Oh, yeah. You can push some of the things in order to have a dramatic effect or in order to develop a voice. I mean, I was just reading the screenplay for Booksmart, which uh, I have to say was a great, fun read. They break the rules all over the place because they really want to communicate the attitude of the movie, and they really do. Um, so, um, <clears throat> you know, 
I, I tell my students, and, and I try and do this, you know, to be uh, um, vivid and pithy at the same time. And part of that means you have to know language. You can't use lazy language and be right, right in a vivid way and, a, and in a visual way, uh, which means that writers need to read. <laughs> and that's one of the that's like number two problem with uh, with with beginning screenwriters is that they they, they want to write, but they don't read. <laughs> and uh, you're not going to get what you need by watching the film uh, if you read the scripts for the. And there are a lot of great scripts out there that they can read and they can uh, mm -hmm. see exactly how this writer presented the material so that the reader and the director sees it in a visual way. You know, I, I go back to, I, you know, I go back to people like Lawrence Kasdan, who I had a workshop mm -hmm. with when I was a student, was one of the first people who really talked about this in, in any, in any uh, way. Um, and of course, um, uh, Paul Schrader was another one oh, who was yeah. a phenomenal writer. Um, you know, I, it's funny, I, I, uh, I, I uh, <clears throat> helped with the republication of um, a bunch of books by um, Edward Dimitrik, and I worked on the on screen writing, and I read some of his screenplays, and it's just not interesting to read. It's kind of like, okay, here are the shots, and uh, it, it's, it's, it genuinely was a blueprint for a film, and rather than a good a good read on the page. Um, so you know, I think that. Uh, and, and in fact, this is the, the book that I'm currently writing. I'm writing a screenwriting book. Um, and, it, and it, you know, you think, oh, man, not another freaking screenwriting there's book. The, what? Uh, there's, there's like three of those out there. There's not that many. All right. So this actually has nothing. <laughs> this actually has nothing to do. I don't talk about structure. I don't talk about building character. I don't talk about mm -hmm. subplots. Or I don't talk about any of that stuff. This is kind of a style manual. The first half of it is the proper way of writing a screenplay. It's kind of like learning a language. You know, you, you learn French, you got to learn the proper way of speaking French in French 101 and French 102. Then you go to France and people are taught saying something else. Of course. It's the same experience as screenwriters. They're taught in a class, you know, this is how you write. These are the rules of screenwriting. Then they go and they, you know, they read uncut gems and they say, <laughs> wait a minute. I was told that that wasn't allowed. <laughs> oh, no. So, you I, When I started reading Lethal Weapon and, you know, all of Shane Black stuff, I'm like, this is not. This is yeah. not. Or, or <laughs> Quentin. God forbid you read a Quentin script. Jesus. Yeah, but yeah, but uh, Tarantino scripts leap right off the page. Oh, Jesus, I mean, do they ever. <laughs> you, you, they are in your lap slapping you around. <laughs> <laughs> As you're reading it. No, there's no question. No reading. question. No question. Um, so, so, so the book I'm writing, that's what, that's what it's dedicated to. The first half is like, here's the proper way. Here are like, if you're a jazz musician, here are the scales. This is what you need to practice. Now, here's how we improvise. Here's how professional writers write. Here's how professional writers um, <clears throat> allow the uh, reader as they're reading to see a movie come off the page. And the one thing that young writers get mixed, sort of mix up, is that they think, okay, I want to give them that cinematic experience, therefore I'm going to describe everything that's in the scene. And that becomes overload, right? Because a, a, a writer, a reader who's reading a screenplay doesn't know your world, doesn't know your story. Um, they're reading and they're finding the clues to what that story is about. What is important? What's not important? So if you have a character walk into an office and you describe absolutely everything in the office, it's a flat scene. Mm -hmm. You may be describing a lot, but it's flat and it's confusing because there's too much visual detail. If you expend less language on the environment and more language on though and more flamboyant language on those things that are really important then the reader gets gets that and holds that as an important thing the envelope on the desk right which is so, which is which is yeah because if you're putting the envelope on the desk is on an ornate uh wooden desk that's a scene it looks like the one from the godfather and its weight is this and it just starts going and going and going you're just like what am i supposed to focus my energies on here Precisely. You know, and young writers love to write about like the light is streaming in through the window. <laughs> Do we need to know that? Who cares? You know, the DP will take care of that. Don't worry. And actually, that's another thing. 
<clears throat> now that you're now that you've got me talking. Um, <laughs> um, I think young writers are uh, are resistant to the idea of film being a collaborative art form. They want to control everything, and you simply That's can't ego. control yeah. everything. They want to tell you how everybody is dressed, um, <clears throat> what their hair looks like, where the light is coming from, the color of the wall. Camera, camera the moves. Says, the camera moves. The camera moves. It's like, you know, no. take it easy. Take all that stuff off your shoulders and then tell your story. And then we'll get to exactly what, what you were talking about, Alex. It's clean. It's got energy. It's got the energy of a movie that's unfolding before your eyes. You know, so it's clean. It's got energy. Um, and the story uh, jumps off the page and the actions reveal. Right. Uh, you know, it needs to be revealed. I was reading the other day the script for Bound uh, by the Wasarskis. So this is the movie right before The Matrix. And in the, in the script, <laughs> in the script, they actually wrote like there was a, there was a, a very big uh, love scene between two girls. And this is also early, late 90s when this is yeah. being made. Yeah. So it's not as open as it is today in regards to that kind of stuff. And they go at the end of it, they go, and we're not going to cut this scene. <laughs> <laughs> in the script and like and we're not cutting the scene <laughs> in see, the that's screenplay ra that's radical that's a radical thing to do right you're reminding me of i just read the script for first man uh, oh okay yeah uh, chazelle okay yeah, yeah. <clears throat> now he takes a lot of liberties in that script which is fun but you know <clears throat> um when you have a track record and people know what you can do, you can take more liberties than when you're a beginning writer, for sure. But anyway, oh. <laughs> there's a scene in there where Neil Armstrong goes into the capsule for some Gemini liftoff. I can't remember the number of the Gemini liftoff. And it's a beautiful scene in the film where everything is is shown through Neil Armstrong's point of view and what he hears and what he sees, which is nothing. It's just like a little little triangle of a window. The entire liftoff, which is super dangerous, is told through the image through this little triangle window. And he says in that scene, he says, um, we're in, uh, we see what Neil sees, we hear what he sees, and we're not fucking cutting away. <laughs> it's literally said that. He literally says that in the, I don't know if I can say that on your It's It's fine. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> anyway, he literally writes that we're not fucking cutting away. To an external shot or something anyway so it's just very funny he's like <laughs> he because he knew what was going to happen he's going to go oh well when yeah. can we get a wide shot on this and like exactly. no that's that's it but he's also a writer director and he knows how he's going to execute it and so on but he just wanted to make that clear as a fun as a fun thing to do um what was the script i was reading the other day um uh, oh it was um i was reading i think it was shane black or tarantino and you know you start seeing some spelling errors in yeah. it sparing error and some even grammatical errors and i always love young um screenwriters who are like well i was reading uh a shane black script and it, you know he had a couple of punctuation yeah. and and i'm like he, he's shane black that's right <laughs> if he wants to misspell something no one cares because yeah. he's Shane Black or he's Quentin Tarantino or he's Chris Nolan. Like exactly. they don't, they, they are at a whole other place that you are not, they've established themselves. And when you're coming up, I promise you that True Romance and Natural Born Killers, which were the first two scripts that Tarantino sold, were immaculate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you know, the thing, the reason that, that you, uh, if you're a young writer, the reason why you can't afford to make any mistakes in your script is because you lose the faith of the reader who doesn't know who you are. And so if they can't trust that your writing is in order, then when you do something in the script that is funky or whatever, or, or really super interesting, they're like, was that a mistake? Or is, is this person in control of their language? Right. You know, so, so you have to... You know, I you know I have a very good friend uh, who's an A-list writer, and he was a former student of mine. Um, and he would rather die than submit something with a mistake, even yeah. though he, I mean, he just sold a script for like four million bucks, you know, or five million bucks, and one of the biggest deals in the last ten years. And he, we, we were, we worked on a project, and we sold. Um, we wanted to write the scripts, but but the the people who bought it uh, from us only wanted. 
our treatments and they wanted to write their own scripts because it was television. They have the writer's room already. Sure, sure, sure. sure. They, you know, they don't want to integrate new people. So we were happy, like, okay, bye. Wow. Okay. Bye. You know, pay us for not writing the script. Fine. Um, um, and, um, so they wrote the, 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 the pilot and they sent it to us just so we could give them some feedback on it. And they were like five typos in like the first two pages. And my friend Bill said, can you believe that? I said, well, yeah, I can believe that they have over 600 hours of television produced already. So what does it matter? <laughs> exactly. At that point, it doesn't matter. And yeah. I, I think that comparison to established people or even legends or masters as young screenwriters is is rampant. I mean, like you said earlier, they're like, oh, Carantino or and we keep using the same name or Kaufman or any of these any of these screenwriters and they compare themselves to it. And, and you can't. You need yeah. to find your own voice. You need to find your own path. Whatever they did, you can't follow that that path. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. It's so interesting. When I was starting out in the business, I would analyze every, I would read every autobiography I could get my hands on on filmmakers. Yeah. I would try to study the way they got into the business. So you're like, okay, so Robert Rodriguez made a $7,000 action movie. And uh, all, right, all right, Clerks, okay, so he did this and he did that. Okay, great. Ed Burns, okay, he did this, this, and this. You know, Spike Lee did this, this, and this. And and you would start and I'm like okay maybe I can get this way and maybe, I was always trying to hack my way in yeah and I it took me years to realize you're like that's their path that can yeah. never be replicated yeah. ev ever because of the timing of who they are and what they are like uh, you know when I had Richard Linkletter on the show I asked do you think do you go do you think Slacker's gonna if if Slacker shows up today do you think it finds an audience. And Rick and Rick's and, and and straight up, like you know, does it find an audience? And Rick's like, probably not. Yeah. And I said the same thing to Ed Burns. I go, if if Brothers McMullen shows up today, do you think you get it a theatrical and it makes thirty million off of a of a <laughs> off of a thirty thousand dollar? Do you think that is going to happen? And he's like, absolutely not. If they were a product of their time. Where in today's world they would they would probably be just thrown into the soup like everybody else. Yeah. Not that they don't have any talent, and not that the movies aren't great. It's just a different environment and a different audience as well. That's true. That's true. But you know, I always, always <laughs> do a few exercises with my students to help them. I guess the term, you know, to to use the term of uh, Michael Rabiger, who with whom I wrote a uh, co-wrote a book, um, to to find their own themes. Like, who are you? What are you interested in? What obsesses you? Right. Um, um, yeah. What are the genres of film that you that you like uh, that you can be inspired by? But but how is it? How do you make it yours? What are the things um, <clears throat> like like I said, like, what are the things that obsess you? What are the things who are the people, you know? who are fascinating characters, who were the places you've gone that you think this would be a, an awesome place for a film. Um, so, you know, you, a writer, you know, like any other artist has to find out what their unique contribution is. But getting back to reading scripts, I do, when I finish my screenwriting one class, which is a about all about the shorts, I give my students a list of like five scripts that will take their language to the next level, not to copy them. And they're always quite different uh, um, uh, genres. And then they are also as contemporary as I can find. So do, are they, are they, uh, do they change or are they, can you give, can you give those five scripts out now, the names? Um, sure. I can, I mean, they're, they're, I find these online. I just say, you know, mm -hmm. I just Google download PDF sure. the title and, yeah. and you find it, you know, as you know, I'm sure you know that when, when award season comes around, you know, these they all pop are, out. Like, yeah. They look, all pop. They're all available on bulletproof screenwriting.tv. <laughs> Yeah, oh, well, I'll go look. <laughs> well, like uh, Jeff Nichols' film Loving. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a beautiful that, movie. Yeah. And the script is the same. It's a very elegant, a very quiet, very powerful script. The language is super precise. And it, it there's no flamboyance uh, to it, but it just tells its story in, in very s simple language, methodically, but really uh, that accumulates power over time. Mm -hmm. 
The screenplays for Chernobyl are phenomenal. Oh, yeah. Well, that's yeah, Craig. Yeah. They're just perfectly written, you know. Yeah, Craig, yeah. Um, Jordan Peele's Get Out is another great script <laughs> yeah. to read, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, D. Reese, uh, uh, Mudbound. Is a mm-hmm. is, is a little bit more flamboyant. It's a little bit more, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, really indicating shots and uh, and cuts. But but it's powerful. You see the movie, mm-hmm. uh, you feel the movie. Um, like I said, book smart. I like to give students all is lost, which has no <laughs> dialogue. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, and that's like, what is it? How long is all is lost? Is uh, I think it's like 40 pages or something like that. Right. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, um, sideways. Oh, another uh, beautiful script. Yeah. You know, great script. Deborah Granick's Leave No Trace is mm-hmm. the simple script, an uh, elegant script, beautifully written, beautiful film, over, kind of a kind of an overlooked film, but I think it's a phenomenal film. So, so that's that's the kind of stuff I, I will give them. Now, what, what advice would you give on writing great dialogue? Because dialogue is such a difficult thing to get the tone, to get the, <clears throat> the energy of, of a character, and also how not to write on the nose, which is so like, it's like, I love watching great television or great movies. And I'll just go, oh, I see where they just dropped off that she's been divorced for five years yeah. without saying, hey, yeah. hey, dad, how does it feel being divorced for five years? I don't know, son. <laughs> It's pretty hard as opposed <laughs> as opposed to a look on the letter, like a look at, at the paperwork of, oh, I have to sign the divorce papers. No one ever says anything. Something subtle like that to get that information across. But how do you write great dialogue? Well, you know, the uh, you know, there's a first the first thing you have to think about. And I'm, I'm going back to beginning writers. The, the first thing that beginning writers big mistake that beginning writers make. Uh, with dialogue is that they think they have to tell the story in dialogue uh, because they don't trust that they don't trust yet that an audience will see an action and understand the inner life of a character who performs that action. They won't, they understand the motivation of somebody who um, uh, does a particular action. They, they don't trust that yet. So they'll do the action and then they'll, they'll do exactly what you just said. We'll see the divorce papers and they'll write the dialogue. Oh, I've got to sign the divorce papers. You don't need this to no. say it. We're seeing it, right? Just so that's the first thing. Show, don't tell. Show, don't exactly. tell. Exactly. Dialogue that's redundant is kills your movie. Oh, Absolutely. It just <clears throat> stops the momentum. It stops the momentum completely. The second thing is that is that there's again, it's it's just a people who don't trust that their movie can that they're already telling their story is um, that there are many times when a look. A, a gesture, uh, a glance mm-hmm. will say exactly what dialogue needs to say. So the first, the first, in terms of dialogue, the first step is to strip away all the unnecessary dialogue and then strip away a little bit more dialogue than that. Um, and then, you know, you need to dig deeply into your character and you have to say, so what what is the purpose of this dialogue? What does it reveal about my character? Not what it does it tell about the story, but what is it going to reveal about the character? What kind of language would this person use? How many words would this person use? I mean, I think that Loving is a very interesting script in that sense because he has he has two characters, especially uh, especially the, the the male lead who is super taciturn, not particularly. Uh, uh, articulate and doesn't talk about things much, right? Uh, or a first man, we were just talking about first man, you know, he, uh, Neil Armstrong <laughs> is not somebody who talks about his feelings. <laughs> no, <laughs> he does not. He never would have been an astronaut. You know? <laughs> so um, uh, you have to understand the, the you know, the language your character uses the and and how much language your character uses and the fact that you have to really understand that they inhabit that story as in life mm-hmm. and so they wouldn't go you know uh explaining things uh for people who don't know what's going on right and and i always find it so irritating when you when they when writers add backstory it, yeah. in a in a very brutal way where they're just explaining it i think the the best um the best example of writing backstory or 
um, what's the word? It's it's completely escaping me when when you have to tell exposition. This. Exposition. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> is James Cameron? James yeah. Cameron, when he wrote Terminator, who I think he's still one of the most underrated writers of his generation. Yeah. He's not as a filmmaker, but as a writer, you read Alien script and you're just like. Oh my God. One wow. of the most perfect action scripts ever written. But if you read Terminator, there's so much exposition that has to be laid out for, because it, we all know what the Terminator mythology is now. But in 1984, yeah. nobody understood what the hell was going on. Yeah. And he's like, if you've got exposition, write it in an action sequence, write it in yeah. something. So there, he's literally explaining, um, Reese is explaining to, um, Sarah Connor, what's going on <laughs> as they're being chased by the Terminator, writing, <laughs> shooting, boom, I'm from this, this, boom, boom, boom. And this is what happens, boom, he's a machine, boom. He has flesh over his body, boom. And it was all, but it's done like this, as opposed to them sitting down at coffee, like, well, you know, I'm from the past. And yeah. it, it, it's beautiful, it's a beautiful technique, yeah. really is. Yeah, well, you know, with exposition, exposition is tough because X, X, okay, what we do is we do narrative. Right. Narrative is the act of telling a story. Exposition is not the act of telling a story. Exposition is the act of explaining something, right? So that's why if you don't handle your exposition well, it puts the brakes on your story mm -hmm. and it becomes uncomfortable. Um, the first thing is you ask yourself, do I need this exposition? You know, think of Thelma and Louise. We never know what happens, what happened to uh, Louise in Texas. We never know what happened right. to is in Chinatown. Right. Like, do we need it? We don't need it. Maybe it's better. In, in the minds of the audience, they can imagine what happened. So do I need it? Do I need all of it? Because sometimes you can pare it down a lot. Do I need all of it in a chunk or can I pepper it throughout the script? Uh, and, uh, then, and then, like you say, put it in a, put it in a scene of, of action and tension or comedy. That comedy, you know, is like a spoonful of sugar that lets anything go down. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and of course, motivate it. You know, you can't, you can't have a scene with two lawyers or one lawyer says the other, my client's going to plead the fifth. You know what that means? That means he doesn't have to <laughs> testify against himself. Of course that he knows what that means. So find a scene guy, I don't know. The lawyer goes to the, to the defendant's mother and says, I don't want you to worry. I'm going to have him plead the fifth. And she's like, what's that? Is that dangerous? What, what, what does that mean? But it's okay. It's okay. Take it easy. It just means he doesn't have to testify against himself. And now there's a reason for exchanging that information. Right. Exactly. As opposed to it being the other way around. You know what that means? Um, yeah. It's like, <laughs> do we know what John Wick did? prior <laughs> to John Wick going crazy because they stole his car and killed his dog? Like, do we, yeah. do all we know is that when they say his name, it's like the boogeyman walking into the baddest, baddest MF <laughs> guys in the world, the criminals of the world are like, wait a minute, John Wick? Yeah. Like, I just watched him. Did you watch Nobody? Not yet, no. It is Wonderful. It was written by Derek. Uh, Derek, I forgot his last name, but he wrote John Wick, and you can sense the John Wick esque ness of him yeah, in yeah. there. And you like, and they have scenes like that where someone's doing research on on um, Saul. I can't remember his name. <laughs> Better call Saul. Um, him, the main actor, Bob Odenkirk. Bob, yeah. Bob Odenkirk. Thank you. And when they and when the person sees it, they're like. Yeah, don't pay me. I'm out of here. And that that's yeah. how much of a badass he is. Um, I was like, oh, that's so brilliant. But no one knows. Like, And he says it, I think, at one moment. He just one sentence to explain who he was. And that's it. In the entire movie, he explains one sentence of who he was. And you're like, that's all you need. You don't need flashbacks. You don't need to see a scene of him being a badass. One thing, but like, even I don't even think it's been explained yet what John Wick yeah. has done in the past. They just know he, <laughs> and for three movies, you still don't know what John Wick did or why he's just renowned. I mean, everyone just knows he's something a badass. against the table. I don't know what. <laughs> no, he did something, and there's been some little things of like how he left, but yeah. the reason of how his legend became who he is has really never been explored very off very much. So it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's sometimes better true. to leave it. That's true. And I think that that's really interesting. I haven't really thought about John, John Wick that much, but it would be, what would be interesting to look at John Wick is where do we get the sympathy for him? Where do we get, like, we like him, you know, we want him, oh. we don't want him to die. 
you know, oh, and why, where does that, where is that located? Because oh, I'll tell so you. Oh, I'll tell you why. There's, there's, we'll just go back to the first movie because now the second, third movie, we already love John. John seems like he's trying to do the right thing. So he's right. trying to, he's trying to be a good guy. Secondly, they stole his car. Yeah. Which is a badass car. And yeah. that gets a certain demographic of the, of the audience. Yeah. Yeah, so the, right. like you right. don't scratch a man's car. I mean, it's in Pulp Fiction. You don't you don't do that. You don't mess with another man's vehicle. Um, so there's that. And third, the oldest trick in the book, they killed his dog. Yeah. What do you want to do to a, to to establish a villain? Have him kick a dog. Of course. It's of the course. oldest. It's the oldest trick in the book for 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 writers. So what do they do? They killed his dog. Yeah. And of course, the villain is just such a dumbass. Yeah. On top, he's not even a badass. He's a dumb. Because if he was, a, but so a perfect example, the guy who does all of this. And sorry for all the spoilers. If you haven't seen John Wick, but it, this all happens in the first fifteen minutes. Um, the bat, the, the idiot who he doesn't know what he's doing. First of all, secondly, if that character would have been an absolute badass. Yeah. It wouldn't have worked as yeah. well. It needed to be a complete buffoon who he was, a complete, just egocentric, over the top buffoon who did all of this. It makes it all the sweeter of what's going. And then the dad is the real badass. You see, you filled it in for me because I did not see the first John Wick. <laughs> I missed the first John Wick. I picked it up because I watched I watched the one where he fights Boban Marjanovic because I'm a basketball fan. So I was like, oh, that I gotta catch that. <laughs> <laughs> John Wick One. John Wick One. Honestly, is as far as action is concerned, it is such a well written script. I mean, Keanu is Keanu. You know, he is. He is. Uh, he is obviously Jesus. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. But all seriousness, though, that um, that first film, there's a reason why there's so much love for that character that it spawned two and three, and now they're going to do four and five back to back. Uh, and the thing is also that we feel for the character because he, you know, he lost his wife. He's trying to, he's trying to turn a, a new leaf. He's trying to reinvent himself. He's trying to, it, it, all things that check little boxes inside, it, it pull on certain strings of our heart yeah. Yeah. that you normally don't see in an action hero. And that yeah. he's, and he, yeah. and that he's quiet. That's yeah. the other thing. He, he doesn't talk. He's a man of action. He yeah, he has exactly. a little bit of dialogue. Best uh, one of the best scenes in the first John Wick is after John. They, 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 someone sent a hit squad for John Wick, and and burnt his house down, or about to burn his house down, or something like that. And he dispatches all of them, and then the cops show up. <laughs> The cops. This is what's so beautiful about this movie. The cops show up, <laughs> knock on the door, and the cop is there and goes, "Hey, John." How's the night going? <laughs> and then he looks inside without blinking. He looks inside. He sees a dead body. He goes, you working again, John? <laughs> He's like, no, nah, man, it's just an accident. Okay. Just checking and walks back, <laughs> just walks backwards. It's like, have a good, have a good night, John. Like Let that, <laughs> that mythology that they've created for yeah. that character is so wonderful that people now there's a show uh i yeah. know the showrunner of the show and he's yeah. writing a show about the world that they created that derek oh. was able to create so it's just it, it's just beautifully written and hasn't yeah. it, it, look we see action movies come and go and we see action heroes come and go and you know this is not a john claude von damme film or a steven seagal yeah. film this is a well no. written well performed exactly. well directed yeah. uh, action yeah. but that's three but it, but at the end of the day it's about emotion it's about yeah. emotion and connecting to that character. And it's not just about the spectacle. Spectacle's fun, but we've seen action before. It's right. his character that moves everything. Yeah. But what's interesting is how little how little one needs to actually, because of we're so used to genres and, and watching films, how little one needs to, to actually use for all of that to come in for the audience. Mm -hmm. And then they get to the other stuff. You know, we, we feel we fill in a lot of stuff. And this is one of the other things about writing. And this is one of the things about using genre. You know, audiences have seen so much. Uh, they understand film noir. They understand Westerns. They understand the, the, the tropes that are used. They understand the melodrama that nowadays writers can use these genres as shorthands. Just a little hint of noir. 
brings the whole genre and many of the issues or the themes of the genre into your movie. So we don't use them fully anymore. We just like like a little shorthand and and it, and it accents our films. And like in you watch movies like from the 70s they had to do things so differently than now because there's been so much content from the moment of the 70s up until now we're talking about 50 years that there's generations have been raised on watching movies again and also in the 80s is when we got vhs that changed the game now we could watch things a thousand times uh, again and again so there's we're so much more the audience is so much more educated which is good and bad good because like you said, you can use shorthand, but bad because now you're like, well, I got to come up with something that they haven't seen before. Yeah. You know? The other thing, too, is that, you know, you have that generation of films that you are uh, filmmakers that you're talking about, the Finches and the Tarantinos and the, these people who are so film literate, uh, who, you know, are, are so profoundly knowledgeable that and they're incorporating all this stuff. And so it almost is like little what can I say? Little master classes in every film, you know, every scene, every scene's a master. You watch the opening scene of social network and that's a master class in, yeah. in, in dialogue, in direction. In that's acting. another script I give my students to read. This, I mean, well, so that's just, I mean, that's sort that's, that's probably Sorkin's best script in my opinion. And he's written some doozies, but it's yeah. just such a tight, 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 tight film. And the way that Fincher and it's, it's probably Fincher's best. And I love fight club. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely adore Fight Club and Seven. Seven is a masterpiece in this genre as well. Uh, but we could just geek out forever. Um, yeah, yeah, Nick, yeah, yeah. But let me ask you so, what's up next for you? What is the book you're writing? Well, yeah, that, the book I'm writing is, I, I was mentioning it before, it's a screenwriting book. Really, it's like I said, it's not about drama, it's not about structure, it's not about character. Really, it's a style manual. Here's the proper way of writing a screenplay, and then here's the way professionals. <laughs> push, break the rules to, uh, you know, for dramatic effects. And oh, nice. here's what you can get away with. It's a good, that's a good angle. Um, yeah. Uh, it's a mastering screenplay form and style is what it's called. Okay. So, yeah, that's that's next up. And I'm also working on a couple of screenplays. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I told you, I just, we just, uh, me and a friend of mine just sold uh, something to Sony. Uh, mm-hmm. It was just, we just sold treatments for a series now they got it so that sort of freed me up to work on some other projects that's awesome um, yeah i have two scripts screenplay projects i'm working on very very cool man yeah. i'm gonna ask you a couple questions i ask all my guests um what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today <clears throat> um oh wow that's a um i would say for a, for a screenwriter, I would say write a lot, but I would find ways to get your work made, even if it's just, you know, pulling together uh, friends who are directors and crew and get your stuff. Um, see your see your writing finished, even if you're just posting it on the Web uh, and also be flexible with the form that you are interested in because writers these days, you know, writing for television, if you're in a writing room, it's a different skill than if you are creating a television show or writing a feature film. It's a very different skill. Um, Be prepared to write shorts, uh, small shorts for YouTube. Be prepared to write for TV. Um, We have to be a little bit more, writers need to be a little bit more sort of polymaths. You know, they need to know a broader range of of skill. And I would say, um, just keep knocking on doors. You know, just keep knocking on doors. It it takes, you know, it's always been like this. It takes tenacity. It really takes tenacity. And always maintain um, enthusiasm and energy and passion for your own work because it can be tough and you can start to lose that and no producer wants to hear somebody pitching a script that they're not that a writer's not particularly interested in it's about skill experience and luck and yeah. luck has from speaking to the people i've had the pleasure of speaking to they always tell me i was lucky i was yeah. at the right place right time right script and but the yeah. point is you, you can't 
put yourself in that position unless you're knocking on doors. Yeah, but there's a quote in the world of chess, which is uh, the people who work the hardest are the luckiest. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So. Exactly. <laughs> if you keep knocking on those doors, it's like one day someone's going to open and go, uh, where have you been? Here's a million dollars. Knock on doors. Meet people. Don't don't drop people. Seek out other talented people and stick to them. Yep, absolutely. No question at all. And you know, the other thing about 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 I mean, I, I'm not somebody who thinks that you have to go to film school, although yeah. film school offers uh, 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 film school offers a, a, a broad range of experiences in a more compressed form. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, my first book I wrote basically, you know, I had a friend who said, you're writing us all out of a job. It's all there. Why, why do they need teachers anymore? And that was exactly my my goal with that book. Mm -hmm. um, but um Students, when they're in school, that's where you form the peer group that is going to be your first professional encounter, first professional relationships out of school. And so you need to find those people you can work with and and uh, and uh, start collaborating with them as soon as possible. And don't don't let them go. I agree with you 100 percent, Mick. Thank you so much um, for being on the show, my friend. I truly appreciate it. Sure, and uh, can continue the great work you're doing, brother. All right. All right. Take care. And it was a, it was a pleasure. I want to thank Mick so much for coming on the show and dropping his knowledge bombs on the Bulletproof Screenwriting Tribe. Thank you so much, Mick. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including how to get his new screenwriting book, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash 170. And if you haven't already, please head over to screenwritingpodcast.com, subscribe, and leave a good review for the show. It truly, truly helps us out a lot. Thank you so much for listening, guys. As always, keep on writing no matter what. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv. 